Out of sight, out of mind, or so the old saying goes. This may ring true for many things, but when it comes to the billions of microorganisms that take residence in our bodies, this isn't always the case. For what microbes lack in size, they make up for in their vast numbers by which they are able to exert significant influence on our lives. And because of this, their presence has always been felt. For centuries before they were even actually observed, the presence of microbes were hypothesized by keen observers in ancient civilizations throughout the world. Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, and welcome back to Beauty and the Bacteria, an exploration into the world of the skin microbiome. In this series, we're taking a closer look at the entangled nature of our skin's relationship to the microbes that live on and in the skin, and how that affects our lives from birth till death. On the last episode, we looked at the history of microbiome science, and why we should all be aware of the importance of the microbiome. But in today's episode that we're calling Microbiome 101, we'll be taking an intense dive into the actual science of microbiology, which is the study of microorganisms, including bacteria. Here we'll cover the discovery of microbiology as a science, the invention of the microscope, which has allowed us to see microbes, the creation of taxonomy, or how we name these organisms, the ways by which we characterize bacteria, both the old methods and the cutting edge methods, and what this all means for the human body. This is going to be a lot of great information, but a lot of information nonetheless. So we'll be dividing the episode into two parts. Regardless, the topic will get somewhat technical in nature. So don't be afraid to pause the video, take a breather, and then come back to it when you're ready to continue so that you can most effectively immerse yourself in the world of the microbiome. So grab your coffee, and your notebook if you want to keep notes. Buckle up and let's dive in. Microbiology is the study of microscopic organisms. In other words, the study of organisms you can't see with the naked eye. The human eye can see down to about one-tenth of a millimeter, and that's pretty small. But most eukaryotic cell organisms are about one-tenth that size. While there was speculation about the existence of microorganisms centuries before they were discovered, it took the invention of the microscope, attributed to Dutch eyeglass maker Zacharias Janssen in 1590, for microbiology to truly blossom as a science. The first compound microscope was made from two convex lenses, which were magnifying images about 10 times, really not much better than magnifying glasses of their day. So they could just begin to see basic outlines of larger single-celled microstructures, but nothing as small as a bacteria. It would take Dutch cloth maker Antoine van Leeuwenhoek about 80 years later in 1677 to improve on the dual lens design, with the creation of the single lens microscope, which was able to provide magnifications of up to 400 times. Quite remarkable for this period in history. In order to see prokaryotes like bacteria, you would have to magnify images at least 400 times, and a thousand times in order to see any type of detail. To illustrate how small bacteria are, a single Staphylococcus bacterium is about one micron by one micron in size, and that's a millionth of a meter. This is so small that hundreds and thousands of these bacteria could fit comfortably within the period at the end of the sentence. Van Leeuwenhoek was able to clearly see microorganisms such as bacteria, yeast, and protozoa, which he called dierchens, which is a Dutch word that I probably just butchered for little animals, and has been translated as animalcules. Although Van Leeuwenhoek is uh, considered the father of microbiology, and he was the first to describe these microorganisms, the term animalcules didn't catch on. For a related anecdote, when British scientist Robert Hooke in 1665 was looking at a section of tree cork under a compound microscope, he noticed the forms of the substructures and called them cells, because their shape reminded him of prison cells, 
or amongst monastery quarters. Hook's naming would later be used for the cell theory, and eventually the general structure named cells stuck, as it does today for describing the smallest structural unit of an organism. It wasn't until 1838 that German naturalist Christian Gottfried Ehrenberg coined the term bacteria. Interestingly, this delay in naming bacteria was because no one before Ehrenberg could readily reproduce the lens magnifications achieved by Van Leeuwenhoek to clearly see the organisms. Subsequently, it was in 1892 that two scientists contributed to the discovery of the first virus, tobacco mosaic virus, which was much, much smaller than any bacteria, about 100 times smaller. So it wasn't until the 1930s with the discovery of the electron microscope that we were able to actually see them. Now that scientists escaped the visual limitations and could peek into the microbiology world, they had a need to classify what they were discovering. This branch of science that aims to classify all organisms is known as taxonomy. Taxonomy uses the kingdom system to classify organisms and consists of various levels to classify different organisms. This includes domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. This system was developed in 1735 by Swedish scientist Carolus Linnaeus when he published a booklet called Systema Natura. So according to the kingdom system, a strain of E. coli bacteria, for example, is classified as bacteria, monera, proteobacteria, gamma proteobacteria, enterobacteriales, enterobacteriaceae, Escherichia coli. To make this a little less cumbersome, the simple naming of a species was reduced to the binomial system of genus and species. So in the previous example, it's shortened to Escherichia coli and abbreviated further as E. coli. But then there's the way that we come up with each of the respective names within each level. Well, as bacteria are traditionally characterized by their morphology, this often contributes to the naming convention. The most common bacteria shapes are rods called bacilli, spherical or round termed coxi, and spiral called spirilla. So for Staphylococcus aureus, the name Staphylo means grape-like cluster, coxi for round, and aureus Latin for golden. And under the microscope, Staph aureus looks like a cluster of round golden grapes. Further, microbiologists classify bacteria by their gram staining characteristics. Gram staining was developed in 1884 by Danish physician Christian Gram, hence the name gram staining. It's traditionally the initial step in identifying unknown bacteria and is only used for typing bacteria. The gram staining process is an application of crystal violet dye along with iodine to the bacteria. Those that retain the color of the dye after rinsing are called gram positive. Uh, bacteria that do not retain the dye are called gram negative. The gram stain attaches to a thick peptidoglycan layer found in the cell plasma membrane. In gram negative bacteria, this peptidoglycan layer is covered by an additional outer membrane that is made up of a layer of peptidoglycan, phospholipids, and lipoproteins. Additionally, the membranes of gram-negative bacteria contain lipopolysaccharides, or LPS, made up of O antigen, core polysaccharide, and lipid A, also known as endotoxin. Endotoxins are antigenic, which means they can cause an immune response in a host, leading to a potentially harmful outcome like hemorrhagic shock, severe diarrhea, or in less severe cases, fever and weakness. Endotoxins remain even when the bacteria cell is killed or destroyed, and sometimes it's responsible for characteristic symptoms of a bacterially driven disease, such as the toxins involved in botulism. However, these toxins are often thermal labile or heat sensitive, so this is one reason why properly cooking food is essential to reduce spread of foodborne illnesses. In addition to the cell membrane, the bacterial cell envelope contains a cell wall made up of peptidoglycans and a membrane capsule. From this envelope, some bacteria may have small hair-like structures called pili, or larger appendages called flagellum, which provide the movement to the bacteria. Inside the bacteria is the cytoplasm, and within the cytoplasm there are ribosomes, a nucleoid or nuclear body, constituting of one loop of double-stranded circular DNA. 
At first, bacteria were typically identified by growing cultures of them on auger plates. Isolating a grouping of clones of a single bacterium called a colony that grew on those plates, and then either identifying the bacteria by staining, colorization, and or shapes and sizes, or additionally by what type of auger plates they grew on. But this method was limited to the type of bacteria that can readily be grown by cell culture. It has been estimated that less than 1% of bacterial species can be grown in culture. This severely limited our view of the bacterial world we live in. But with the advent of modern molecular biology, we've been able to further characterize bacteria through genetic sequencing. And with the advent of next generation sequencing technologies, such as 16S ribosomal rRNA gene sequencing, we have been able to classify samples of microbes with resolution that allows not only classification of genus and species, but also to the level of subspecies, and many times, even what proportion of microbes are in any given sample. So what is 16S ribosomal RNA and how can it be used in the taxonomy of bacteria in the microbiome? This part is pretty technical, but I'll try to keep it as concise as I can. The 16S ribosomal RNA or rRNA gene is a conserved feature. In other words, it's found in all bacteria, but only bacteria, with individually unique sequence regions which can be used to classify even to the subspecies level, kind of like a fingerprint for any given strain of bacteria. 16S rRNA is actually a part of the whole bacteria ribosome, which is a part of the bacteria that helps to convert genetic code into proteins. Ribosomes consist of a large subunit made up of 23S and 5S rRNA, and a small unit made up of 16S rRNA. The 16S rRNA subunit is about 1,500 nucleotide base pairs long and has sufficient genetic differences to distinguish various genus, species, and subspecies of bacteria, where the other two subunits do not. The 16S rRNA is made up of sequences that are consistently the same in all bacteria, the conserved regions. And then there are the regions which are highly variable, termed V1 through V9. It is these variable regions that when sequenced, reveal DNA code that allow us to classify a complex mixture of bacteria in any given sample. Some systems today can capture, amplify, and sequence millions of these nucleotide pieces at the same time. This collection of sequence data, or metagenomic data, allows us to capture information on bacteria that were not able to be detected previously because they weren't culturable. Now, there are other clear advantages to the 16S rRNA technique and some other limitations that I really don't have time to outline here today. But the takeaway is that 16S sequencing is a direct, culture condition independent way to provide considerable amounts of bacterial community data which allows us to determine the fingerprint of any given microbiome. And that, my friends, concludes part one of Microbiome 101. We covered the discovery of microbiology as a science, the invention of the microscope, which has allowed us to see microbes, the creation of taxonomy, and the ways by which we characterize bacteria. In part two, we'll take this information and boil it down so that we can understand what this all means for the skin as well as the rest of the body. That was a ton of information and there is more to come, but hang in there. If it doesn't already, it should all make sense once we put it into perspective. Each episode after the series airs, I'll be spending some time on social media answering questions from you, the viewers. So please send your questions, comments, or topics you would like us to cover to comments at beautyinthebacteria.com. You can also follow us on social media listed here, including my personal handle at dr.t.hitchcock to watch Q&A sessions, interviews, or to send us your questions and to receive updates on this series, as well as other news and information on skin microbiome initiatives at Crown. From all of us here at Crown Laboratories, thank you for watching. And remember, you have billions of bacteria on your face, and we think that's awesome. Goodbye for now.